You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling-up business coach Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash Thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash Thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeldt. I'm your host. And our guest today is Scott Reeb, and he is with Reeb Law. And we're going to talk a little bit about not only kind of what it takes to build a successful law practice, but really a different approach. So Scott has looked at how law services typically are rendered or or structured from an engagement point of view uh, and has some interesting idea. We're going to talk about his access program and how it's really designed to help the business owners uh, better kind of plan and better use legal services in a way that's, uh, I think, better structured for business needs. And um, I'm always curious to kind of hear the stories of of what people are learning, both as entrepreneurs, as well as, you know, a company that services businesses and sees patterns and sees trends in the industry and what he's kind of noticing about successful service businesses. So with that, Scott, welcome to the program. Bruce, thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your background, kind of the practice, uh, what you've learned as uh, essentially an entrepreneur, a business owner. And then we'll talk a little bit about the unique and different approach that you're taking to how you engage with clients around legal services and, and we'll take it from there. So give us a sense of the background. How did you, why law? How did you decide to start your own practice? Tell us some of the experiences you've had as a business owner. Sure. Yeah. And I've, I've been doing this 23 years, which seems impossible. But 23 years. You started when you were about six years old? I was six. Yeah. <laughs> and this all kind of came out of my early career out of college. I wanted to do marketing, which meant sales in 91. Uh-huh. And so I was, uh, I found a way to convince AT&T to bring me on as an authorized independent agent. And I was selling aftermarket parts and things to their business phone system clients uh-huh. in the Tulsa, Oklahoma market. It was a, a great gig for me. I was making more money than I really thought I would make. <laughs> uh, I had figured out a way in their system to, uh, to generate quotes for expiring maintenance plans on their systems. Uh, send them out in the mail, get about fifty percent of them back with nice sales, you know, nice sales letter, and then follow up on the rest of them. And about a third of those would come in. And so I had mailbox money, and we we rocked in that for about six months. And then a new manager came to town uh. and loved what I had created, but decided they wanted to pay some more minimum wage to do it instead of paying me yeah, of the course. commission. <laughs> and so they shut it they, down. <laughs> they they sent me down to. Uh, Southeastern Oklahoma, uh, where at that point they had some business phones, but they were few and far between. And the idea was for me to go down there and die. And so they <laughs> sent me down there and breached up in breach of my contract. And so I went to see a lawyer and was told I had a great case, but it's AT&T. And so unless you have about a hundred thousand yeah. dollars, um, there's really not any way you can litigate that. So yeah. I did what every normal human would do. I went to law school. <laughs> I'm going to be my own lawyer, damn it. <laughs> I, will, and I will not be locked out of the system again. Yeah. So I yeah, applied yeah. to the University of Oklahoma in the spring of 93 and took off the next fall and moved with my wife to Norman and spent three great years in Norman becoming a lawyer. She taught school and paid our bills while I did that. Mm-hmm. And then I went to work in my first job in a corporate litigation firm, which was a great opportunity. And I learned very quickly that I did not like being on really high-end corporate litigation cases, billing people by the hour on conference calls that I didn't understand half of what the engineers were talking about. I wasn't providing anyone any service or any help, not really. At least that's how I felt. And so I started trying to find other parts of the law that I could do where I really felt like I was making a difference and ended up moving uh, from Sherman over to another small town about an hour away uh, in Denton, Texas, just north of Dallas. And was a partner in a three lawyer firm there for a while. And we were doing much more meaningful work, helping people whose land was trying to be taken from them by the government, catastrophic injury cases, 
a lot of different stuff and we would do a lot of it on contingency where we were getting paid for the value that we would deliver to the client. Sure. Uh, yeah. I like, and eventually, uh, as most firms do, there's disagreements and they blow up. And so yep. that one did. Yep. And so I went to work for another, another law firm for about three years and then decided it was time for me to do my own thing in 2005. Yeah. And so I quickly made an exit of that firm and formed what is now the Reeb Firm PLLC. And then we picked up a DBA Reeb Law eventually because people kept asking me, what is the Reeb Firm? So I, <laughs> I made it even simpler. Rule, and, the rule number one is be, be careful about how you name your company. <laughs> yeah. What's the Reeb Farm? Oh, no, it's the firm. And so we, <laughs> what do you grow? We were, yeah. So we rebranded it about three years later and have been Reeb Law ever since. Yeah. And I started out doing all kinds. I mean, just if it came in the door and you were breathing, it was a case. I took it <laughs> um, and wanted to try to build a, a client list. I knew the value. There was a, The value was in having the client. It didn't matter so much what I did for you at first or even what I charged you as long as you started to think of me as your lawyer. And so the first round, I was giving really great deals. The second round, not quite as much. When they would come back for something else, I would raise my prices a little bit. And then the third round, I would try to be more at market rate. And we went, walked along that way for about six years, and that was working very well. Uh, but I had a problem and that my business clients specifically were only calling me when everything in the world was wrong, was going wrong, right? Mm -hmm. They were in a mess. And then I, I could help them fix it. It was usually very expensive, took a long time. And at the end, even if we won, they weren't happy because it cost too much. Yeah. And so they would go away, go make another mistake and not call me before they made the mistake yeah. and then come want me to fix it again. Yeah. And so I went and hired my first business coach in 2012. Mm -hmm. I went through a couple before I found one that really understood what I wanted to do because I'd had a conversation, oh, probably, oh, uh, 05, 06, uh, early in my firm with a small business owner that was kind of in the uh, adjacent suite uh, to me. He would come over for coffee sometimes and he was like, you know, I really wish there was a way that people like me could afford people like you. Mm, interesting. And it really stuck with me yeah. because most business owners really couldn't afford to come pay me a $5,000 retainer to help them stay out of trouble. Uh -huh. And they didn't want to pay me for every 15 minute phone call and and no. so it, it just stuck with me and I finally decided I wasn't ever going to do anything with it unless I hired somebody to help me build out the idea. Yeah. And so we hired the coach and a few months later we had what was called the access plan. And the access plan changes the old model, right? The old model of legal services is that uh, you'll give someone gives the lawyer a retainer and then they bill by the hour. The lawyer gets to determine the rate or the time they spend. So they're going to they're gonna make whatever money they want to make mm -hmm. on the deal. It's no, it's just how it is. And I'm not saying that lawyers are being unethical or doing anything wrong. It's just, that's just how yeah, it's the, just system the nature works. of the system. Yeah. Right. And so I had to flip that. And so what we came up with was the subscription model. It's a lot like you'll see um, IT managed services where they'll come in and manage all your computer systems for a monthly fee. Yep. It's very much like that. And it just seemed like I, that you should be able to do that in the legal field where I had enough experience that I should be able to estimate kind of what things really should cost, how I can make a, still make a profit on it, but provide access, on-demand access to legal professionals so a business owner could call and get questions answered in real time and not have to wait. And they can get documents reviewed before they sign them. Mm -hmm. They can start using written agreements in their business that have been prepared and reviewed by a lawyer. And so that's the stuff that we put in the plan. And then kind of the key to all of it was that we would build in monthly calls where we would talk to one on one with the business owner for 20 or 30 minutes every month so that we were 100 percent focused on their business during that time and that they would have contact with us so that we could deepen the relationship so that they would share more with us and use the plan more. Yeah. And I started looking and I found other lawyers that were trying to do this <laughs> what they were doing was selling blocks of time yeah kind of pre-selling them or they were setting up something and then hoping no one would use it mm, and yeah, that like wasn't, a gym like a yeah, gym membership yeah yeah right that wasn't the idea i wasn't just trying to set up a, a revenue stream although i, I like that part mm -hmm. the i wanted business owners to actually interact with a legal team on a regular basis so they made better decisions and so 
that's how we did it back in 2012. It's changed a little bit. Every year it updates a little bit. We add more things, change some things around. I think we had five different work plans originally. Now we have three. Mm-hmm. And so it changes. But we have 71 small businesses in it as of as of last Friday mm-hmm. that are enjoying the on-demand legal services. They're all over the country, all different types of businesses. A lot of them are service businesses, but a lot of different, a lot of different things. Yeah, I'm sure. Everything from doctors to roofers to plumbers. Yeah. Every kind of thing. It's interesting. I mean, the, the two things that really kind of strike me about it, one, one is that it does, it provides kind of the business owner with a reasonably predictable cost, right? Like it's like, I know what I'm going to spend on a monthly basis and I know I'm going to get kind of these things covered. Even if the service, even if I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to need services for, I kind of know what my cost base is going to be. But the other thing I really like, and I, I, I find the same things on the accounting side, which is it really allows you to be much more of a strategic partner than, you know, kind of someone you call in an emergency. <laughs> so, so, and then the accounting yes. side has been like this, like, uh, I need to do my taxes. So you do, you know, you do your tax return, but you're really not providing, you know, advisory services or, or really helping the business owner understand how their business is running from a, an accounting point of view. In this case, you're looking at how can you actually be a constrictor consultant from a legal point of view and actually advise the client around preventing some of the problems or optimizing some of the situations or, you know, making smart choices or, or setting things up in the right way so that they're going to be more successful and, and reducing risk. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I, I really like that kind of approach. Talk to me about the actual structure, like how, what is, what is included? How have you kind of um, both, you know, provided these services in a, in a way that's more helpful for the business owner, but also for you operationally, how have you operationalized this so that you can run a successful business? from your side. Okay, so first thing that like the, in all three plans, they all include unlimited contact with my team by email and text. So you can get questions answered that way. All of the plans have include at least the creation of one legal entity, whether it be an LLC or a corporation. All the plans have at least one. As you go up, you get more depending on how entrepreneurial you, know, you are or what your structure needs to be. And then they all have email support and and what I call an SOS call, where if there's a real legal emergency and you need, I need to talk to Scott, even if it's at night, then they all have my cell phone and can get a hold of me for that that call. And it comes with their monthly subscription. We also have an Access VIP membership site where I've got some business legal training for them, video modules. We have what's called a shatterproof document vault, where there's documents that I've created for the Access members to be able to use in their business. Uh, as long as they don't alter the document, they fill in the blanks, they're ready to go. If they want to change it, then they just send it back to the team and we review it and bless it. Mm-hmm. And so those things are included in all of them. And then as you go up, you get more things like face-to-face meetings. Uh, we'll do training for their team. Well, I'll come in and, and do either uh, either legal training if it's a certain thing that they need, or we'll do uh, business training to help them if they're trying to scale scale their business, maybe they're having trouble with their team culture, then I'll come in and and do some training for them. And then as you will do strategic planning for our top level clients, but all three levels have what you would need to make sure that you're, you have a touch point to keep your business between the lines. And then as your business grows, then we grow with you and you, and you go up. And so, I mean, you can have, you can be an access member for as little as three twenty five a month. Wow. Yeah. That, right. I mean, that, that's a, a very reasonable price point. <laughs> yeah. And obviously there's not a, a ton of profit for me at that bottom level, yeah. but it's still, like I said, how I founded the firm. I want you to be, I want you to be a client. I think that I have found that the access plan is a lot like, it's a lot like crack and that as soon as you get something you keep, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you want, you want more. And so we do try to really make it affordable. And then, I mean, uh, you know, looking behind, you know, pulling back the, the drapes yeah. and going by, back behind scenes, uh, I don't do all of the legal work myself. Sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we have what I what are called reblock preferred providers that help me with that. Mm-hmm. We use tools like Zendesk uh, mm-hmm. as our help ticket center that tracks all of the questions uh, and document reviews and the tickets that we need to work on. Um, we have other um, we use some other you know we use Slack for inner uh, inner intercommunication to make sure we're keeping up with all of them. Mm -hmm. We use Zoom. So most of our meetings with the clients are either face-to-face in person or they're face-to-face over Zoom and where we can share screens, look at their their stuff. They can see see my screen if I need to share a particular document with them. And so by utilizing technology, we're able to be very efficient 
and then we everything is shared so they have access to their documents very quickly over the internet. And by doing that, we've been able to very efficiently um, handle, like I said, we're at 71, 71 clients, and we're kind of at that, we're starting to, to scale to scale it up where we'll, we'll need to add more in-house legal staff very soon. But right now with uh, a full-time paralegal, a couple of uh, almost full-time, uh, what I, my, like my group coordinator that is just kind of the touch point and does all the scheduling and client orientations. And then I've got a media person that helps us keep track of all of our, all of the social media contact sure. that we have. We're able to manage uh, this group so far, but you know, we have big plans of scaling to a lot larger numbers because we need to help a lot more people. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you've you've got a, a unique, well differentiated model that um, I'm sure is going to have some traction. I guess have you noticed what types of companies you know have been you know most interested, have turned out to be good clients, have you know have re- seen real benefit at the company or the the service? What types of companies are what kinds of businesses have have worked well for you in terms of the access program? You know, a lot of people in the in the construction industry. Uh, not just general contractors, although that's done been they've done very well with the program. A lot of different sub subcontractors, also electricians, HVAC companies, plumbers have found uh, the program to really be a nice fit for them. There's just not they don't have a lot of resources out there to help them make sure that they're using the right documentation with their clients, that they are, are able to resolve disputes the right way because they. I mean, in every business, you can't make everyone happy all the time. <laughs> but when you're when you're dealing with people's homes, especially, there's just a lot of a lot of chance to make people unhappy, and then they have to figure out the best way to resolve it and document those resolutions. And so, anyone that's in those homes has been a really has been a really good, has really enjoyed the access plan. And so, we have a lot of people like that. But we also have uh, like, like medical medical professionals that are their practices are our clients because they every once in a while have big legal needs. And, you know, and it's, we have some clients that use it all the time and are very um, active. And then we have some clients that aren't super active that they just like the peace of mind knowing that we're here if they need it, if they need it. And so they're looking at it more as insurance and not being as proactive as we'd like them to be. But I can't, you know, we, we can't make them do that. <laughs> you can try, but it's tough. You can't change yeah. people. And how have you gone about your own marketing and, and sales process? Like where, what has been successful for you in terms of being able to get the word out there, find new clients, onboard, sell? What, what's been your strategy? You know, the, it's, it's been a mix. So we've done, uh, I've done a lot of, I did a lot of cold calling uh, early in the plan to introduce myself to business owners, as well as um, what I would call synergy partners which for us would be CPAs, financial planners, life insurance guys and gals. Those people have our clients. And so early on, I did a big tour and introduced them to the plan. And that's been very helpful because we get a lot of referrals from them now. Mm -hmm. And then we've done a lot of direct mail. And then we're fairly active in on social media and doing ad campaigns there. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's been a little trickier but we're starting to get it dialed in a little more. The, that's because we're interrupting people and they don't necessarily want to think about legal stuff when they're mm-hmm. searching Facebook to see what their friends ate for dinner. Uh, and so it's been, a, <laughs> it's been a little challenging. So yeah. we're, but we're still, we're still trying and we are able to build some following doing that. It's just trying to, to actually have that convert has been difficult. So it really, the best thing that we can do is just build relationships with other people that are doing similar things and that trust us. And then they yeah. send their clients to us. And that's kind of been the best way of doing it. And then I do, I do speaking, I'll go speak um, anywhere someone wants me to. If there's a business event where they're trying to help business owners grow, I'll, I can go do that. And then uh, podcasts have been a really good thing for me as well, yeah. where I can reach a lot of business owners at once that are actually you know, wanting to improve their businesses. And so then they can reach out to me to take care of that part of their business. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, like I said, it's a well differentiated product. So I can I can imagine that once you get when, once people start hearing about it, they're they're quite curious. Um, in terms of kind of challenges that you've had 
you know, either with the business in general or with the access program, what, what are some of the things that you've had to learn, you know, either kind of a business, business strategy or your own kind of leadership? I always find it interesting when when experts, you know, whether they be, you know, technical, legal, uh, you know, people that are really good at providing a service move into kind of business leadership, business growth. You know, how, how have you had to kind of evolve yourself or your mindset or your approach to to things to kind of grow as a leader to be able to grow the company? Yeah, I think I, I've had to change my style quite a bit. I tend to be very pushy uh, mm-hmm. and try to push things on my team. And culture is important to me. And I've kind of figured out that I have to really kind of just go set the example of what I want the culture to be. I mean, I've, our office is very, we've set it up strategically so that the, our core values are everywhere you look, our mission statements everywhere you look so that they're surrounded by it. Mm-hmm. I do I do ask them to memorize those things too. And we're always I'm always reading books and providing those books and making them available to them, but I don't require them to to read it. Uh, when I tried to do that, I really it really kind of backfired and they felt too much pressure <laughs> and didn't didn't want to cooperate. But if I just bring those things up in conversation with them, yeah. things I've learned from books, uh, that are making a difference in, t- in our team meetings, then they seem to be more receptive to taking a look at it. And so really just more from leading, leading from actually leading from the front. What is it? John Maxwell says, if you look behind you and no one's following, you're probably not a leader. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I kind of found myself there sometimes. And so lately I've, I've done that. We've tried to be really careful who we bring on the team. And I think my, but my, I think my biggest struggle with trying to run This kind of business is that, as we discussed earlier, it requires me to use independent contractors for things and I can't control them. Yeah. And that is, um, I don't like that. I want to control people. (laughs) Don't (laughs) we all? Don't we all want to control people? (laughs) Yeah. And so that's been a little frustrating. Uh, I now at least have a layer between them and me. So I, the the access coordinator has to deal Uh, with them directly, but that's, uh, that's been a struggle. And so we have to make sure that we have, enough providers in our system that if a couple of them decide they want to go on vacation uh, without telling me that they can and and we still are able to keep moving yeah because it's it's, uh, like i can't tell them when that they can't go on vacation i can't tell them when they have to work and so that's a different part of the model because most law firms if you you know you bring on associates and you can just tell them to work all weekend and I can't do that with contractors, but I also couldn't scale this without them. So I've just had to, had to adapt to that and try to, you know, I mean, try to get people that are responsible enough that they will let me know in advance yeah. Yeah. and remember that the reason they're contractors is they want the flexibilities when they decide they're going to go on a trip spur of the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And any, I think else that you've learned about what ends up making a good kind of contractor partner for you, either skill set or mindset or things that you've learned on how to either source, recruit, interview, you know, manage, onboard. I mean, I'm just always curious about talent, how people find talent, how people recruit talent, how do they manage talent, how do they onboard talent? Any insights that you've learned now over, you know, having put together this program? Yeah. And so, yeah, you're right. And it is about talent. And so you have to know what you're looking for. So so if they're not going to be engaging with my clients directly, like they're not going to be talking face to face or over uh, even over the phone, their personality doesn't doesn't matter as far as do I think they'll present well to clients? Can they communicate well with clients? I don't care. It's can they draft? Can they draft quality legal documents fast? And so I'm looking. So the personality type I'm looking for, and I'm a disc guy. So I'm looking mm-hmm. for people that are C's. They could care less about going to parties and don't want to talk to anybody. They just want to sit down and do the work. And so I can find them much more quickly now that I know what I'm looking for. And so we require everyone, you know, before I ever talk to them to do a profile. And then we have some example assignments that we have asked okay. them to do so that I can get an idea for how, how they follow instructions and then how fast and how fast they can do it and then what the quality looks like. Because if they take really long to get it back to me, even if it's really good, I know they're probably not a good fit because they're going to take too long and that slows down the system and doesn't work. So you guys got to be a combination of fast, of fast and quality. And the other thing is the instructions. Like I give very detailed instructions. For instance, they have to download the assignment sheet, 
and then there's a few things on that for there's links for them to do things and then they have to turn in a couple of documents and then they have to upload their finished document back into a folder and if they don't do all those things right they don't ever show up they don't get scheduled for me to do a phone interview with them yeah it's interesting we used to do a similar thing in my tech business was you had to send it a particular email address and a particular format and it was just a, a way of filtering out people that could pay attention to the details and people that could not I guess you generally in recruiting processes I'm always looking at or trying to decide strategically, are you more willing to tolerate false negatives or false positives? Meaning, is it worse for you to let someone through the process and actually come on board who might not be a good fit or to lose a potential candidate that could be a good fit, but filter them out too quickly? And it, it somewhat depends strategically on the talent market. And is there, you know, are you is there a, a dearth of talent that you really need to make sure you get everyone possibly in, even if you let a few ones through? Or is it so costly to let bad hires through that you want to really focus on it? Where, where do you kind of fall on that? Which would you rather have? You know, make a bad hire but not yeah. lose someone that's good or you know, just never take the risk of springing on someone that's, that's not a good fit? Yeah, I, I, I'm to the point now where I'd never want to have someone that's not a good fit. Yeah. And if we find out they're not a good fit, then they're gone immediately. Yeah. We can't wait because it just takes one bad experience and yeah. we'll, you know, and then we'll lose a client and our churn, our churn rate, you know, starts going through the roof. And so then the whole, the whole model of recurring revenue doesn't work. It's all that we have to not just sign them up, but we have to keep them, you know, for two, three years at a time. And we have clients that we've had for seven years. So yeah. it's all about the, it's about quality and speed. And if they can't do that and I, and I I have any hesitation about it, then they can't come on. I'd rather I'd rather have to stay up late and do the work myself. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, I think part of it for me that that's striking is the whole because of the way you've set up the model and the fact that you you really only gain the benefit or the the value of a customer if you keep them for a while. If you lose them, you know, you're destroying the benefit that you've built up. And mm -hmm. and versus a traditional law firm, it's like, well, I'm, I'm making money every 15 minutes that I'm billing, so it kind of doesn't matter, or I can, you know, I'm less susceptible to that. Interesting. If people want to find out more about you, about the access program, what's the best way to get that information. You know, the best way for them is to go to reblaw.com forward slash scaling up. And we've got a special offer on them for scaling up uh, listeners. They can sign up there for a 20 minute laser legal coaching session with me. And we'll focus on their business for 20 minutes. And see, I'll try to give them as much value as I can in 20 minutes. They can also download uh, my five proven strategies to shatterproof their business on that same page. And then they can link back to reblaw.com to get more information. Uh, but that's going to be the easiest thing for them to do is at reblow.com forward slash scaling up. Or you can find me on uh, social media, Facebook and Instagram at the Scott Reeb. Great. I will make sure that all those links are in the show notes. And I would encourage everyone who's uh, in business and, and hasn't, even if they have kind of done some legal work, if they haven't done any legal work, take it up in this. Having been through several legal situations, it's the making sure that you've got a good basis set up is hugely important. It's a great investment. It will save you a lot of a headache and quite a bit of money later in the process. So I encourage everyone to check it out. Scott, this has been a pleasure. I appreciate the conversation. Great insights. I love the program you've set up and I appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, Bruce. It was great being on. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter. 